Hello and welcome, I'm Praveer, and today's session is Quantum Frontiers, charting the course on three quantum computing trajectories. Now in this session, I'm going to begin by looking at the double slit experiment, which was instrumental in launching our inquiry into the quantum realms. And I do this to set the context for the three trajectories I'm going to look at. Trajectory one is a gate-based approach, which is the common approach being pursued by the quantum computing industry. We also have another approach that I call a whole systems approach that is being pursued by some companies. I'll transition to a summary of qubits that will have some takeaways from both trajectory one and trajectory two. Then I'll look at the third trajectory, which I call quantum sensing. And this, as you'll see, is arises when we consider an alternative interpretation of a double slit experiment. This will lead also to the ideas atoms as quantum computers, and then I'll bring it all together in this section on quantum frontiers and suggest also a path forward. So let's revisit the double slit experiment. I'm going to play a brief video created by PBS. It's called the quantum experiment that broke reality. And each bundle can be broken into small parts. That means that each photon should have to decide whether it's going to go through one slit or the other. It can't split in half and then recombine on the other side. That shouldn't be a problem as long as you have at least two photons. One photon passes through each slit and then the two photons interact with each other on the other side and produce our interference path. But here, we get to one of the craziest experimental results in all of physics. The interference path is seen, even if you fire those photons one at a time. Well, let me back up a bit. The first photon is detected as having arrived at a very particular location on the screen. The second, third, and fourth photons also, they deliver their energy at a single spot. And so they appear to be acting like particles of well-determined position. But check it out. You keep firing those single photons, you start to see our interference pattern emerge once again. By the way, Veritasium actually conducts this experiment in his excellent series on the double slit experiment. Really worth a look. This is so bizarre. This pattern has nothing to do with how each photon's energy gets spread out, as was the case with the water wave. Each photon dumps all of its energy at a single point. No, the pattern emerges in the distribution of final positions of many completely unrelated photons. How can that be? Each photon has no idea where previous photons landed or where future photons will land. Yet each photon reaches the screen knowing which regions are the most likely landing spots and which are the least likely. It knows the interference pattern of a pure wave that passed through both slits equally, and it chooses its landing point based on that. It turns out that the photon isn't the only thing that does this. So let's summarize some key points from this double slit ex experiment. So first of all is this idea that photons projected one at a time through two slits creates wave-like interference patterns on the screen behind. And this is counterintuitive. We generally expect that if there's two interacting photons, they could create an interference pattern. But here, the astounding thing is that even when it's sent one at a time, it still results in a wave-like interference pattern. So it appears from this point of view that each photon has a knowledge of interference pattern and knows where to fall on the screen to adhere to it. So it's as though an individual photon is crossing limits of time to share knowledge with past and future photons, and thus displaying superposition in that it adheres to wave knowledge of many possibilities until it hits the screen, and also displaying implicit entanglement because it's sharing that knowledge with many different photons that all end up in different places on the screen behind it. Now, there's a couple of interpretations for this, and this here summarizes the double slit experiment. There's the bottom-up interpretation that's the interpretation in effect. And the point here is that if one sees the experiment from a bottom-up or a reductionist approach, from the point of view of each photon, 
then the perception of photons connected to past and future and assuming infinite values gets reinforced. But we can alternatively also interpret this experiment from the top down. So we can view this experiment as a totality where no part is separated from the whole. And here we have a whole WL that is basically wrapped in the space-time configuration encompassing the whole experiment. And if we think about this whole as having many different properties, say these are quantum properties L1 through Ln, then we can think of each photon that leaves the source as being correlated to one of these properties and then showing up on the screen based on its correlation with a particular property. So then there's a functional aspect that comes to the forefront where again, each individual photon contributes to this final interference pattern based on a functional basis uh, as summarized over here. So let's pursue this a little further in two different ways. One is I'm going to construct a world uh, based on this whole, and this is a thought experiment. And then I'm going to transition to how this actually shows up in reality before we actually look at all the different quantum computing trajectories. So let's look at constructing a world based on thought experiment. So in this world, each photon, as I said, originates from an, a quantum computational whole WL that is in reality bringing forth or carrying something of WL. So each photon can be thought of as bringing forward something that is part of WL. WL can be thought of as having unique and distinct quantum properties. And these properties can be represented by a set of quantum properties, L1 through Ln. Now, each photon can then be thought of as being related to or derived from one of the elements in the set, so that when it hits the screen behind, then it takes on the form of some function BL, where L is related to one of the elements in the set. So here we have a distinct a range of functions that show up physically on the double slit. And different photons will adhere to these different sets. So in this thought experiment, each of the strands highlights a unique aspect of WL. And the set or strand will practically consist of up to infinite photons that each highlights some subtle variation or nuance related to the strand or set it belongs to. So if we have infinite number of photons, then we can think of these photons as each occupying a unique place in this strand. And in this point of view, every single photon is then first a function or belongs to or is correlated to one of these sets, but then in that set holds a unique position, if you will. So imagine that this is a base layer. So remember, we're constructing a world based on the whole. So this is the whole, and the photons are bringing forward some properties, and these show up as here as a base layer that consists of BL. And the point here is that all of these BLs combined bring forward only some aspects of WL, but WL as a whole can be thought of as having more that can be expressed. And so now if we begin to combine these elements and these different sets together in unique combinations, then we have infinite number of seeds that becomes the basis of a second layer that we can call SL, and that's just represented by the unique permutations of elements of these different sets. And this process continues because, again, the idea is that the whole, this quantum level, has a wholeness to it that can never fully be expressed, no matter what's actually being parsed out in reality. So we have then in this thought experiment, the base layer BL, we have a second layer SL that's a unique combination of the different elements in each of these different sets. 
And then we have subsequent layers in evolving form that continue to capture more of WL. So that's the thought experiment and the idea of actually getting to holes rather than measuring things. That's a departure from looking at the quantum level um, as we'll see in, in a couple of the trajectories. Now, this can be summarized by this brief graphic here. And what we've just traversed in this thought experiment is the right-hand branch. So it's a top-down branch where we have certain L properties and then there's different layers that express more and more of that whole. And I'll come to this bottom-up branch in a few minutes. Now let's just translate this before we continue into how this may show up in the real world, how this wholeness might show up in the real world. So we have the quantum level, and then we have different levels of granularity. We have this level of quantum particles. We have the level of atoms that uh, show up in a periodic table. And then we have the le level of uh, life or any living cell that, that contains molecular plants. Now, as we know, when we look at cells, whether it's a plant cell, an animal cell, or a human cell, there are only four molecular plants that animate any living cell. And these molecular plants are called proteins, polysaccharides, nucleic acids, and lipids. However, when we look at the essence of what these molecular plants are, they can be denominated in terms of a simple function <clears throat> or a simple concept. So if we look at <clears throat> proteins, for example, then proteins, we know there are over 30,000 different proteins in the human cell. They're involved in all kinds of chemical reactions and moving uh, parts, uh, components from one part of the cell to the other or substance from one part of the cell to the other. They're ubiquitous. So they have in a, a, a simple way of saying it, they're denominated in terms of a function that we can call presence. Polysaccharides is uh, chains of sugar molecules and provide power. And so we can simply just denominate it in terms of a function that we call power. Nucleic acids, we know, create the DNA and the library of the cells that contain all the information. So we can denominate it in terms of a function that we call knowledge. And lipids, we know, create natural compartments in cells that allow work specialization and harmony. And so we can denominate limit lipids in terms of a function that it represents called harmony. Now, when you go back a level of granularity to the level of atoms, then we know that the periodic table has four groups of atoms as the S group, D group, F group, and P group. And if we look at some representative atoms in each of these groups, then we also can see that it's denominated in terms of these same functional patterns. So for example, when we look at D shell atoms, uh, things like iron, cobalt, nickel, aluminum, and so on, that create the, uh, that can be considered to be workhorse elements that create the infrastructure of, of cities, roads, and so on, then we see that that is capturing some kind of functionality of presence. When we look at S-shell atoms, atoms like hydrogen and helium that are responsible for the nuclear fusion and power uh, suns and stars, then we can say that broadly speaking, that it can be denominated in terms of a function that we call power. When we look at the P-shell atoms, we know that there's first a arch archetypal property here where different categories or different parts of the periodic table can be represented in atoms that show up in the P-shell. So we've got stuff like metals, non-metals, metalloids, and, and so on. And then also we have the basis of computing machinery in silicon and then carbon, the basis of, of life. And so we can say that this archetypal imprint is denominated in terms of a function that we can call knowledge. And similarly, if we look at F-shell atoms, then we can consider this to be an experiment in collectivity and we have large atomic numbers here. And so we can denominate it in terms of a function that we call harmony. When we look at the standard model, which captures the quantum particle level, then we know there are four categories of quantum particles. There's the Higgs boson, leptons, quarks, and bosons. And we can similarly represent these in terms of a simplified function. So the Higgs boson we know 
is required for any other particle to show mass by interaction with the Higgs field. And so we can represent or denominate this simply as capturing the essence of presence. Leptons, and if we take the surrogate of an electron, we know that the release of capture of electrons is usually accompanied by power. And so we can denominate leptons in terms of a simple function called power. If we look at the atomic number that actually dictates the behavior of an element in the universe, and we know that atomic number is constituted by number of protons, and protons in turn, in turn is constituted by number of by quarks, then we can say from this kind of logic that quark is representing or denominated in terms of a function that we can call knowledge. And similarly, when we look at bosons, we know that any quantum particle that combines together um, it basically requires bosons. And so we can denominate bosons in terms of harmony. The point being that there's a similar function which we call roughly presence power knowledge harmony that animates all of these different levels. And when we reverse extrapolate, <clears throat> it makes sense that this must exist at the quantum level and then show up progressively as more and more sophisticated forms. So more and more of the wholeness that's existing at the quantum level is getting passed out as these functions become more and more sophisticated across these levels of granularity. So we see this idea of wholeness getting parsed out from the quantum level in a practical way in this interpretation in the real world itself. Now, having looked at this as the basis, let's begin to look at the trajectories that are really driving quantum computations. So first, we have the common trajectory of the gate-based approach. And in the gate-based quantum computing, uh, simply speaking, it's harnessing unique properties of qubits and quantum gates to perform computations in a fundamentally different way than classical computers. We can break this up into quantum bits, into quantum gates, into circuits and algorithms. And if we look at qubits, then basically they embody both superposition and entanglement, which are key quantum mechanical properties. The quantum gates manipulate these qubits, so leveraging the properties of superposition and entanglement uh, through uh, different kinds of specific quantum gates. Um, it becomes the basis for creating circuits that can then execute on different kinds of algorithms. And so that's the idea behind gate-based quantum computation, and it's basically a sequential operation where quantum gates are combined into circuits to perform complex algorithms uh, qubit by qubit. Now, when we look at topological quantum computing, this is also a gate-based architecture. And here, the ideas are that qubit is represented by non-local topological or protected states that are encoded in something called anions, which can be thought of, or which are quasi-particles in this two-dimensional system. And the computation itself is performed by a process called braiding, where the anions have moved around each other in specific patterns. And the braids represent the quantum gates in this um, conception. So we've got quantum circuits that is a result of braiding operations, and then we have the, the advantage of fault tolerance is why Microsoft has pursued this, because basically you've got something that's far more robust in this quasi-particle that, in a sense, is connected to the two-dimensional space within which the computation is occurring. And then you've got the direct implementation of gates, which uses braiding. And then, again, this is all based on a sequential computation um, gate-based um, computation, and so it falls in the gate-based um, architecture approach. So if you were to summarize, what's the essence of a gate-based approach? It basically, one can think about it as the sequential operations of quantum gates on qubits. 
And where in the WL world will gate-based approaches fall? And so this gets us to the second branch that we're going to look at now. And we can, first of all, start by considering the act, the necessary act of employing probability and statistics to decompose and recompose WL. So we've got WL, and as we know, the act of computation and then finally the measurement of it requires that whatever the quantum state was, it's going to collapse into something measurable. And so we decompose and we are recomposing WL through probability and statistics. This act of observation we can say results in something called RWL that's different from the wholeness of WL. So while WL still exists, we are now dealing with something called RWL. And if WL contained L properties that we went over previously, we can think of RWL as containing different set of observed properties, R1 through Rm, and the R elements and R properties create an R set. And this is, in a sense, the continuum or the um, computational basis of any computation that's that's going to be created. So just as in digital computers, we create a foundation of uh, bits where we're manip manipulating zeros and ones. Here, essentially, we're working with, with an R set that is um, some kind of, is based on, on qubits, on the measured quality of, of qubits, rather. And this is the version that of quantum computation that the industry is currently focused on. And this is represented by this left branch here, which equates to the bottom-up interpretation of the double slit experiment in that WL is being reduced to RWL, and then we're dealing with our properties. And so that's the foundation of this trajectory one. So let's look at now trajectory two which is a whole systems approach to quantum computation. And the key difference here is that unlike the gate-based approach where qubits are acted on individually by gates, we have a couple of different paradigms in the whole systems approach. One is the measurement-based quantum computation. And the common aspect of the whole systems approach is that it starts from either a highly entangled or highly superposed states of many or all qubits that are called a cluster state. And this is prepared beforehand and becomes a resource for computation. And then the computation proceeds primarily by single qubit measurement. So there's a sequence of single qubit measurements on this entangled state and the choice of measurement basically determines the computation that's going to be performed. This is accompanied by some classical information. And the measurement-based quantum computation is considered to be universal. So just as gate-based approach arrives at or, or can be configured to create universal computation, the same is true of measurement-based uh, quantum computation. Uh, one of the advantages of this, of the measurement-based quantum computation approach is that it's considered to be less complex because it revolves around an initial state, an entangled state, which has all possibility embedded in it. And then the computation is due to single qubit measurements that's easier generally to implement than complex gate operations. <clears throat> when we look at needing quantum computation, then it's similar in, the, in regard that there's an initial state that's a, that's a highly superposed state in which all possible solutions are embedded. And then the computation actually leads this, this whole state toward the solution by following what's called an adiabatic quantum computational process. So there is a initial Hamiltonian that 
sets all the qubits in a state of maximum superposition. And then there's a final Hamiltonian that's created through uh, something called the Ising model, which basically represents the problem to be solved. And there's a scheduling function that, that transitions in a sense from the initial Hamiltonian to the final Hamiltonian. And so long as this transition occurs adiabatically, meaning that the quantum state is continuous in a ground state, then the final Hamiltonian will represent the optimal solution. And this is the idea of kneeling quantum computation. And it's well known for optimization problems, which have already been on the market for 15 years. So how does the whole systems approach differ from the gate-based approach? And simply, the simple answer is that because you're manip manipulating the whole state, all qubits together, as opposed to gate-based operations acting on single qubits uh, in sequence. Now, there's an interesting parallel or comparison to be made between linear versus systems thinking and gate-based versus whole systems quantum computation. And I bring this up because we know that there are classes of problems that can be solved much better when used, when systems thinking is, is used. So we can bang our heads with linear thinking on, on certain kinds of problems, but the nature of seeing the problem, if it's a complex problem, from a complex adaptive systems paradigm where we recognize different properties and qualities allows us to create much more robust solutions. And this is something to keep in mind as we think about quantum frontiers and uh, the projection of, of possibilities forward. Because we have gate-based quantum computation that more follows a linear paradigm, and then we have the whole system's quantum computation that I just introduced, that we can see has parallels to the complex adaptive systems paradigm. And so there must be some use cases in which the whole system's quantum computation that is, in a sense, more deeply paralleling a complex systems approach or systems thinking approach would be more beneficial. So where in the WL world where whole systems approaches fall? And here, paradoxically, it's still in the reduction or the left branch simply because all final measurements are reducing quantum states to something measurable. And that's the whole paradigm of the whole systems approaches when it comes down to actually computing something. And so let's just summarize these two by looking at the kinds of qubits that exist out there. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we have the whole systems trajectory and we've got the gate-based trajectory, as you can see, there's many more players in the gate-based trajectory. We have D-Wave and Zandu and the whole systems approach that have specific qubits, uh, flux and photonic qubits. And then you've got <clears throat> players like IBM, Google, Rigetti, INQ, Continuum, Microsoft, and so on, <clears throat> on the gate-based approach that use a different, of, uh, different kinds of qubits. And there's different advantages to each of these qubits and different challenges. So now let's get to uh, the third trajectory, which has to do with quantum sensing. And here, I want to just draw attention to the advancement that's taken place in the quantum sensing industry. And we've got, for example, quantum magnetometry that allows us to measure much more sensitively magnetic fields. We've got gravimetry that's based on atom interferometry that has that offers new levels of precision in measuring gravitational fields. We've got advanced timekeeping with optical lattice clocks. We have gyroscope and accelerometer, quantum inertial sensing that allows very precise measurements of rotation and acceleration. We've got the Rydberg atom-based quantum electrometry that allows 
unprecedented sensitivity to measure electric fields. And then we've got quantum enhanced optical microscopy. And the point is that here we're learning to leverage aspects of the atom more fully to create practical applications and technologies. And here's a brief overview of this industry. You can see many different players across the world and we can see the, the sensing focus that they have, the technology that they're leveraging and the key application areas that are increasing day by day, which again shows the prowess in beginning to leverage the atom differently to actually do many uh, tasks that we perhaps wouldn't imagine were possible a couple of, of decades ago. That gets me to the idea of atoms as quantum computers. And this, I'm going to draw a link with the real world WL that I had shown earlier, where you've got atoms that are displays of wholeness from the quantum level. And so keep that in mind as we go through this. But the point here is that the atom is nature's ubiquitous quantum computer. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, atoms are comprised of quantum particles, as we know. The nuclei are made from quarks bonded together through the action of bosons. So that's quantum particles. We know that the electrons exist in stable orbits around the nucleus. So the electrons exhibit superposition. So we're seeing this quantum mechanical property. We can also say that any atom that shares atomic number is going to show the same properties regardless of where it is. And so it's exhibiting this property of entanglement in another way. And we also know that the life, lifetime of these states endure. So <clears throat> this stable entity, that, that's the atom, that's it's the basis of um, so much of both animate and inanimate life, we also know there's a continual state of change due to the interaction or release of photons. So we can say that there's certain input that an atom is subject to, it changes its states and it outputs uh, either photons or electrons. And so it's fair to say that the atom is in a persistent dynamic of quantum computation. And not only that, but it's robust because it can operate in a range of different environments. And as we know, it's scalable. It can create molecules, chains of molecules, molecular plans, and, and so on. So it becomes, in that sense, a ubiquitous quantum computer. The question is, what's it computing, or what's its computation based on? And here we can take an example of, say, silver that has an atomic number 47. We know it's going to have very precise behaviors, it's going to be ductile, malleable, non corrosive superconductive, and so on. And so we can say that there's some kind of code that's represented by this atomic number. We may not be able to see this code but as yet, but we can think of it as pre-genetic code that exists for the same purpose as genetic code in cells. And then the question is, what are other naturally occurring quantum computers? And as I mentioned, there's molecules that have to be also more sophisticated quantum computers when you compare to atoms. There's molecular plans that I gave the example of lipids, proteins, polysaccharides, nucleic acids that are even more sophisticated. And then you've got cells that are also can be thought of as sophisticated quantum computers that comprise of these different molecular plans. And then rhetorical question, what are cells computing? They're basically computing code, genetic code that we know maintains the integrity, possibilities, and boundaries of cells. And then also there can be change to this code based on different kind of circumstances that cells are subject to. So the question is where could quantum sensing and seeing the atom as a quantum computer lead us? Because currently when we look at the atom, we don't necessarily see it as a quantum computer. And somehow our advancement in quantum sensing will inevitably lead us to seeing the atom differently and perhaps we'll see more precisely the kind of genetic type code that animates it and the possibilities that it's leading to. I'll come back to this toward the end of 
uh, this session. The second question is where in the WL world will the atom-based approaches fall? And as I mentioned earlier, the atom can be thought of as a parsing out of wholeness from the quantum level in a whole that is itself a quantum computer. And so it falls on the right side that's leveraging L properties. And again, this is an area of development that yet has to be pursued. So let's now transition to quantum frontiers. And when we consider gate-based approaches, which is trajectory one, we know what kinds of developments need to happen to make these commercially viable. There's error rates and quantum error correction that is a huge focus. There's qubit coherence and decoherence. There's the scalability issues. There's quantum gate fidelity, qubit connectivity, control and calibration that has to continue to create reliable quantum computers. There's the cryogenics and infrastructure that's a key part to keep that computer operating at almost absolute zero temperatures. There's hybrid quantum classical integration that's already being pursued. And then there's software and algorithm development that will separate the possibility of quantum computers from traditional computers. So as we know, it's the combination of all these different areas of development that have to be pursued yet for uh, at least a few more years, and some estimates say 10 years. <clears throat> We're currently at, say, roughly the 500 uh, logical qubit uh, range. And to perform uh, something like Shor's algorithm, we apparently need about a million qubits, logical qubits, so we're still a ways away from, from getting there. But this is certainly a key trajectory of development going forward. The second trajectory based on whole systems quantum computation, uh, it's uh, similar except, and here I'm going to focus just on D-Wave. We've got um, annealing quantum computers that are already at 5,000 qubits. These are not universal quantum computers like the trajectory one gate-based approaches but they focus on specific optimization algorithms. And uh, the, the, the point also is that optimization is already a large class of problems that have lots of different practical applications. And, and so there's already a lot of useful use cases that can be accessed or solved using this annealing quantum computing approach. So some of the uh, issues are uh, displaying quantum advantage. There's some controversy in the market around whether annealing quantum computing really offers that much more advantage than classical optimization approaches. Uh, but, but I'll step back from that. And I'll, my answer is that, yes, it does, because as we saw earlier, the you've got the whole system approach that is leveraging inherently a complex adaptive systems paradigm, which means that the likelihood of systematically getting to something that's called quantum supremacy is going to be higher in this kind of approach. One of the challenges remains qubit connectivity and coupling because any kind of problem has to be represented by connection of qubits, there's the problem of decoherence and noise in quantum annealing, which can detract from uh, an ideal solution being reached. There's the problem that has to continue to be worked on of embedding problems into quantum annealers. Then there's the problem specific nature of quantum annealing, which um, I suggested earlier is focused just on optimization problems currently. There's qubit quality and precision that is always an issue. And this can detract from the reliability of fidelity of the quantum annealing process. So there needs to be continued work on this. The thermal effects could have the same detrimental effects. There's the quantum annealing schedule optimization. That's always an area of development. And then there's just re-emphasizing uh, perceived competition with classical algorithms. 
Now, when we look at trajectory three, this is more of a vision. This is looking at the future. So whereas we had trajectory one that is well underway, we have trajectory two that has already got a number of commercial applications that have been on the market for 15 years. <clears throat> trajectory three is something that has yet to occur. It's powered by continuing advances in the different quantum sensing technologies and also by the emerging field of atomtronics, which will increasingly allow an atom's wave-like nature to be harnessed, and that's going to be very important. It will be possible, I believe, from a combination of these sensing technologies and atomtronics to begin to look even further into the quantum realms and to discover new patterns and properties that we can then leverage through LLM and LQM type AI that will allow us to leverage different kinds of patterns in life and matter that can enhance the very structures of physics, chemistry, and biology. So the idea of universal quantum computation, which is based on an understanding of a set of quantum mechanical properties, then remains in jeopardy of question, as I'll go over in just a minute. And then you've got, because of this different kind of possible properties that emerge, a different basis to then potentially create quantum computers and different kinds of quantum computers. So there's a whole possible area of development that's we're barely beginning to touch that is suggested by this trajectory three. So summarizing, We've got quantum computing trajectories of gate-based quantum computers. Uh, it requires improvements in error correction, qubit coherence, quantum gate fidelity. You've got whole systems approach that's already on the market. And this can, can also requires advanced, continuing advancements in quantum connectivity and reduction in noise interference. This will only boost computational reliability. You've got quantum sensing that depends on, as I said, advanced sensing techniques to harness deeper patterns and potentiality embodied by atoms. As we know, there are major investments currently being directed towards gate-based quantum computing. And these are by companies with deep pockets like IBM, Google, Microsoft, that are aiming for universal quantum computation However, the idea of universal quantum computation, I believe, is complex because, as suggested by the quantum, quantum sensing approach, there's new kinds of possibilities that can arise that can change the conception of quantum mechanics. And so the idea of universal quantum computation is going to remain a moving target. In fact, there might be as much of a shift between bits and qubits and between qubits and something else that's required to leverage other properties and patterns that we may perceive due to advancements in atomtronics and quantum sensing. And that is both exciting and also humbling at the same time that no matter how much we know, there's always going to be more that we do not know. In the near time, the demonstrated success of quantum sensing and quantum annealing in delivering practical solutions suggests focus on specific reliable technologies. So there's plenty of um, investments that can be made in whole system quantum, quantum computation, annealing, annealing, quantum computation, quantum sensing. And this will still allow the field to evolve in response to future discoveries. So in conclusion, quantum computing has a future that involves multiple trajectories. You've got the gate-based approach that can one day reach universality. You've got whole systems and quantum sensing approaches that provide specialized solutions and will reveal potentially new quantum principles. And together, these trajectories promise to redefine computation, transform industries, and expand scientific knowledge. Thank you.